Hello, in this video we're going to go over um, elementary functions. So what are elementary functions? Um, and what's the purpose of uh, these elementary functions? If you look back at what we have done so far, we have talked about continuous functions and we haven't talked about a lot of different examples of continuous functions. The continuous functions that we have are quite limited in fact. We have polynomials because those are just created by addition and multiplication of uh, um, continuous functions x and constants. We have rational functions which is polynomial over polynomial and we have rational exponents. So you can take square root, cube root, raise the power of 7 over 15 and things of that sort and we also can talk about uh, inverse functions so we have um, inverses of uh, functions uh, under some certain circumstances um, are continuous and under some other certain circumstances are differentiable so these are the really the only functions that we have talked about and these are the only examples that we have we would like to have more diverse examples of functions that are differentiable um, and continuous. So as a result, we're going to talk about natural logarithm and exponential functions. There are multiple ways of approaching this uh, subject. In different places you will see people approach this uh, um, subject of uh, um, uh, elementary functions, logarithms, um, exponential functions, uh, trigonometric functions, and their inverses in uh, different ways. Some people start talking about series and then they define them as uh, using their power series. Some people um, define exponential first as a solution to a differential equation and then they use logarithm as the inverse of that function. In this class what I'm going to do is I'm going to define natural logarithm then we're going to define exponential function e to the power of x as the inverse of that natural log. Okay this theorem is going to define uh, natural log. So theorem is this. There is a unique function f from 0 infinity to r for which f prime of x is equal to 1 over x for all x positive and f of x f of 1 is equal to 0. Okay so um, unfortunately I do not uh, have the tools to um, prove this theorem yet. The proof of this theorem requires us to talk about integration and we haven't talked about integration yet. A at least that's one way of proving the existence of such a function. However, the uniqueness follows from the identity criterion because if you have two different functions satisfying the same thing then um, they have to differ by a constant and since f of 1 is 0 the, constants, uh, must be, the constant must be 0. So, um, <clears throat> we can prove the uniqueness, but um, this is actually the very first theorem that I'm now going to provide a proof, and the proof is going to be provided in, the, uh, in a later chapter, in the next chapter. But at this point, I'm going to assume that such a function exists, and we can prove the uniqueness. That's pretty easy to prove. Okay, so given this function that f prime of x is equal to 1 over x, for all positive x and f of 1 is equal to 0. We would like to prove these properties of logarithm. This function is what you know as the natural log. However, I won't use natural log as the notation for this function yet because I don't want to confuse myself as like basically knowing the properties of natural log and then just applying them. I'm going to call it use capital F for the name of this function and of course keep in mind that this is in fact a natural log function so that's the objective the objective is to define the natural log function and prove the properties of natural log okay so what are the properties of this function f um, the first one is f is strictly increasing so why is f is strictly increasing because its derivative is positive so f prime of x is equal to 1 over x which is positive for all x inside the interval 0 to infinity. Thus, f is strictly increasing um, and hence 1 to 1. Okay, so that's pretty 
straightforward. By the monotonicity criterion, it would be strictly increasing. Okay, so the second part of the theorem is about natural log of A, B equals natural log of A plus natural log of B. That's basically what I'm trying to prove. If you think about the function f, what we know about this function is its derivative. We know some information about its derivative, and we want to extract something about the function itself. In order to do that, we often use identity criterion. So here is what we're going to do. In order to show these two are the same, I'm going to show their derivatives are the same, and then I'm going to show they are the same at one point, and then apply the identity criterion. However, if I were to use the derivative of the two sides, I need one variable. So let's just fix one of the a's or a or b, one a or b, and let's change um, b. So let a be a fixed number in 0 to infinity and define a new function. Um, I'm going to call it g from 0 infinity to r by uh, g of x is equal to f of a x I'm going to take the difference of the two sides minus f of a minus f of x now I'm going to find derivative of g g prime of x is equal to f prime of a x times the derivative of inside which is a minus 0 because f of a is a constant minus f prime of x this is by the chain rule now I'm gonna substitute f prime of 1 over uh, f prime of ax f prime of x is 1 over x so f prime of ax is 1 over ax times a minus 1 over x which is equal to 0 Therefore, f is a constant. I'm sorry, g is a constant. g is a constant by the identity criterion. If I can show that g is 0 at one point, then it would be 0 everywhere. So I need to plug in one value for x that gives me 0. So what value of x is easy to evaluate? That is in fact 1. So that's f of a minus f of a minus f of 1. And that's clearly 0 since f of 1 is 0. Thus g of x is 0 for every x inside 0 to infinity. And that means f of a x is equal to f of a plus f of x and that's exactly what I wanted to prove okay so now let's look at the third part of this f of a to the r is equal to r f of a same strategy I have some information about derivatives of two sides so I'm gonna let x to vary and by the way, r must be a rational number because I don't actually know what it means to raise a number to an irrational power. This is in fact one of the things we're going to do today. Um, so defines so again similar to the previous uh, part of this theorem. Define a function. You could use the same g. You could use h. I'm just going to write it down as h just to avoid any confusion. By h of x equals f of x to the r minus r f of x. We are going to take the derivative and of course we need the chain rule. By the chain rule h prime of x becomes f prime of x to the r derivative of inside r x to the power of r minus 1 minus r f prime of x which is equal to f prime is 1 over r x to the r r x to the power of r minus 1 minus r 1 over x 
Now I'm using the properties of exponents. So this would be r over x because the exponents must subtract when you have a ratio minus r over x which is 0. So that means h must be a constant function by the, by the identity criterion h is a constant function. Now let's plug in some value for x. So it makes, it, it makes sense to plug in 1. So that would be f of 1 minus r f of 1 and that's clearly 0. So that means h of x is equal to 0 for all x inside the domain which is to say f of x to the r is in fact r f of x. So this completes the proof of uh, this part of the theorem. Okay, so finally I would like to show that for every c in r there is a unique x that f of x is equal to c. Okay, so the uniqueness follows from the fact that it's one to one. So I only need to show existence. How do we show f of x equals c has a solution? That's typically done by IVT, by the uh, intermediate value theorem. You show there is something more than c, something less than c, the function is continuous, therefore this value c must be obtained. So we're going to create something that is more than c and something that is less than c and then we're done. Um, so I would like some some value f of x that is more than c. So if you think about uh, f of uh, f of x and how, how can we show that basically f of x goes to infinity. So think about that the fact that natural log grows uh, grows slowly. So how do we show that in fact goes to infinity? It is by in putting the input to be very large. For example if you put the input to be 2 to the power of n then by the previous part you can take n out and that gives you uh, what you want. So you get n is greater than c over f of 2. And by the way because f is strictly increasing f of 2 is positive. So and that creates something that is larger than c. For the other side we will create um, f of 2 to the power of negative n. And then if you si simplify this one, we get c is greater than negative n f of 2. So that gives you negative c over f of 2 is less than n. So these are the things that we need. So we're going to use the Archimedean property. Um, okay, first of all, I'm going to show that f of 2 is positive. So since f is strictly increasing f of 2 is more than f of 1 and f of 1 is 0 so that means f of 2 is positive okay so in this side we in this part we assume that c is a real number so we're gonna use the Archimedean property by the Archimedean property there is a natural number n and there is in fact two natural numbers so let's call it n and m such that n is more than c over f of 2 and m it could be even the same integer positive integer but it doesn't really matter more than negative c over f of 2 okay so this means n f of 2 is more than c and m f of 2 is more than negative c so that means c uh, f of 2 to the n is more than c and negative m f of 2 is less than c so c is going to be between it is less than f of 2 to the n 
and greater than f of 2 to the negative m. By IVT, by the intermediate value theorem, there is some x between 2 to the negative m and 2 to the n such that f of x equals c. Note that since f is differentiable, it is continuous. So IVT applies. So I can use IVT since it is continuous. Okay, so there is a solution for f of x equals c. Um, and uniqueness follows from the fact that f is 1 to 1. Because it is strictly increasing, it is 1 to 1. So there cannot be multiple values of x that f of x is equal to c. Okay, so we're going to move on and talk a little bit more about uh, this uh, logarithm or this capital F function that we found here. So we showed some of the properties. Now that I'm done with these properties, I'm going to use the notation ln of x. And since I know it is a strictly increasing function, I can define its inverse. So the unique function f satisfying f prime of x equals 1 over x for all x positive and f of 1 equals 0 is called the natural logarithm function and is denoted by ln. We denote the inverse of this function by x so it's the exponential function. The domain of um, natural log is uh, all positive numbers. Therefore, the range of exponential would be all positive numbers. The range of natural log, as we just showed, is all real numbers. Therefore, the domain of exponential would be all real numbers. The unique positive number e, that ln of e is 1, is denoted by e. So e is the one that satisfies ln of e equals 1. And it is some, sometimes called the Euler's number. Note that ln of x and x of x are sometimes written as these without the parentheses. Now, derivative of natural log is 1 over x. In fact, by definition, derivative of the inverse function, if you use the inverse function uh, derivative of inverse theorem, you would get 1 over derivative of uh, ln evaluated at x of x, x. Derivative of ln is 1 over input. And that's exactly just x of x. So exponential function is a function whose derivative is itself. OK. First thing is. In fact, this exponential function is the usual exponentiation. If you think about exponent as natural as a rational number, so remember that we don't know that um, how to define two to the power of root two. We know two to the power of five. We know two to the power of one fifth. We know two to the power of negative seven over eighteen. Things of that sort we can define, and we have defined. But we don't know how to define 2 to the power of root 2. So we're going to get to get to that. So first, there's a close relation between this exponential function and, in fact, ra exponents for, for those exponents that we know how to define them. And those are rational exponents. So if you look at natural log of e to the r, by previous theorem, that is r natural log of e. By definition, so this is theorem 6.2, this one is definition above, this one is r. So now, since exponentiation is the inverse function of natural log, exponential of r, x of r, becomes e to the r. This is since x is just the inverse function of natural log. So that's a pretty straight, straightforward uh, theorem. 
Therefore, if you want to define, so let's see what the theorem tells us. It tells us e to the r by the old definition of ex, uh, rational exponents is in fact the x of r. So if I have a an irrational exponent, I can just define e to the power of square root of 2 to be just x of root 2. And that's what we're going to do. So the above theorem motivates us to define e to the power of x as x of x for all real numbers x. Furthermore, since x and uh, ln are uh, inverses of each other, we have a equals x of natural log of a, which, mean, which is exactly e to the power of natural log of a. Because these are... Um, these are inverse of each other. Thus, by any reasonable definition of a, any reasonable definition of e to the power of x must satisfy e to the power of x equals that. And of course, um, note that the above definition, the above will have to be turned into a definition. So we don't know that that is in fact the case. This is just something that we haven't even defined. So it's not really a fact. So that's something that we have to turn it into a definition. In order to make sure this definition is, in, is definition is compatible with exponentiation when x is is a rational number, we need the following. So if I define it a to the power of x as e to the power of x natural log of x, I would have to first check that this is in fact um, true for rational exponents. So. And this is also not very difficult to prove. a to the power of r is equal to x of this. I'm just going to do the natural log of a to the power of r. This is r natural log of a. This is theorem 6.2, the one that we just proved earlier. And that's why if you do x of r natural log of a, you get a to the power of r. And that's exactly what we wanted to do. So now that we know this equality holds for all rationals, we can uh, state a definition for all real numbers. So if r is any real number, we are going to define a to the power of r as x of r natural log of a. Okay, so that brings me to this definition. So for every real, a positive real number a, we need the base to be positive because um, uh, the domain of natural log is all positive real numbers. Um, so we can define a to the power of x. This is the de this is the definition. a to the power of x is defined as x of x natural log of a. That's just a definition. So if you want to define two to the power of root two, you would define it as x of root 2 natural log of 2. We know what natural log of 2 is, we know root 2 is, what root 2 is, and we know the x function. It's the inverse of natural log. So that is how we can define it. There are other ways of defining exponentials when uh, the exponent is uh, irrational, but um, this is just one method. Okay, so next the theorem about uh, properties of exponents. This one is something I'm going to skip the uh, skip the proof, but I'll give you an idea of uh, the first one. And the proof of this is in uh, one of the examples in the um, digital uh, textbook. So if you look at natural log of a to the x, that is in fact x natural log of a. So that's the first property of, that's one of the properties of natural log that we proved. And the reason is, if you look at, so this is proof of a. If you look at natural log of a to the x, this is natural log of, by definition, a to the x is x of x natural log of a. And natural log and x are inverse functions. So that's exactly just um, x natural log of a. The way you prove the other parts is um, using this property. So use this property and then the fact that natural log is one to one. So instead of proving this equality, take natural log of both sides and prove that equality. And then use properties of natural log. Okay, so I'm going to skip the proof of uh, this one, but it is in the digital textbook if you're interested. Okay. 
So next, I'm going to uh, find out what the derivatives of these functions are. And um, this notation that I use, if I have f prime of x, sometimes I would use df dx. This is another notation for derivatives, which you have certainly seen before. Okay, so let's see what is the derivative of a to the power of x. What we are going to do is we are going to write down the definition of a to the x. Definition of a to the x is x of x natural log of a. Now, exponential function, its derivative is itself. So I got to do x of x natural log of a times the derivative of inside. I'm using the chain rule. which is equal to x of x natural log of a times natural log of a. And that's exactly, by definition, this is a to the power of x. So that's exactly um, what we have in part a. Okay, so here I use the chain rule. The second part of this uh, theorem uh, gives us a def the derivative of x to the power of b, or the um, power rule. So we're going to do the same thing. We are going to write down the definition. This is x of b natural log of x. And then use the chain rule. By the chain rule, this is x of b natural log of x times the derivative of inside b natural log of x. x of b natural log of x is x to the b. That is by definition again. And derivative of that is b over x. And then by properties of exponents, I can rewrite that as b x to the power of b minus 1. This is the previous theorem, in fact. This is theorem 6.5 part b. x to the power of a over x to the power of b is x to the power of a minus b. Okay, and that finishes up the proof for this one. Okay, perfect. So we proved the derivative of um, exponential functions, a to the power of x, and then we also proved the power rule x to the power of b, the derivative of x to the power of b is b x to the power of b minus 1. <clears throat> you might ask, can we also do something similar for exponential functions? What do, I mean, what do I mean by that? What we did, if we go back and look at the initial uh, definition, what we did was we defined natural, uh, a natural log by, uh, as a solution to a differential equation, or to be more precise, a natural uh, solution to, a, uh, to an initial value problem. A differential equation with an initial value. Can we provide a similar um, definition or a similar characterization for exponential functions. Is there any exponential, is there any differ differential equation that I can say, well, if it satisfies this differential equation, along with perhaps some initial condition, then it would have to be an exponential function. And the answer is, in fact, yes. And this is the subject of our next theorem. Okay, so let's see and k be two real numbers, then the only function f from r to r that satisfies f prime of x equals k e to f to the f of x for all x in r and f of 0 is equal to c is f of x equals c e to the power of kx. So again we have two functions f and c e to the power of kx that we want to show they are the same. Um, so the first thing that we can think is that we have some information about f prime. So perhaps we have to use identity criterion. So let's take the derivative of both sides. Derivative of the left is going to be f prime. Derivative of the right is c k e to the power of k x. If we can show this equality, then we are done. If we substitute f prime by what, by what we know, 
we will get to that and that gives us back into what we wanted to prove so this is not going to be helpful if I take the derivative I get the same thing okay so this method doesn't work um, we have to manipulate this so the idea is, is correct because again we have some information about the derivative and we want to get to some information about the function itself the idea should be the same however we have to manipulate the given um, equality and if you divide both sides by or I guess multiply by e to the power of negative x negative kx we would like to prove this equality for that we would need to prove f times e to the power of negative kx is um, a constant function or its derivative is zero and we will go ahead and do that so um, take the derivative of this function f of x e to the power of negative kx by product rule this is f prime of x e to the power of negative kx plus f of x e to the power of negative kx times negative k this is by chain rule and product rule okay now f prime is kf so that becomes kf of x e to the power of negative kx and then I can subtract, I can put the negative k in front, I get negative k f of x e to the power of negative k x. And that of course is zero. So by the identity criterion, um, f of x e to the power of negative k x is a constant function. And the domain is a uh, the entire real line now if you evaluate this function at one point and we can find it then we are done and there is an initial condition given f of 0 is c so we can just plug in 0 in there f of c uh, times e to the negative k times 0 is equal to c times 1 which is c that means f of x e to the negative kx is c which means f of x is c e to the kx and that's exactly what we wanted to prove we wanted to prove f of x is c e to the power of kx so exponential functions can also be categorized using initial value problems meaning differential equations along with initial conditions okay now in a similar manner we can also define sine and cosine functions involving other types of differential equations it would have to be higher order differential equations but in any case we can define sine and cosine functions using differential equations we will skip that and assume without proof the following properties of sine and cosine so these are the properties that we are only really going to be using in some examples just so we have more examples to um, be able to uh, work with um, okay and these are the properties that uh, you will be using in some um, examples and exercises there are periodic functions, uh, periodic differentiable functions, sine and cosine, from R to R that satisfy these properties. The range of both sine and cosine um, is in closed interval from negative 1 to 1. And remember that these are both differentiable functions. Derivative of sine is cosine, derivative of cosine is negative sine. We have the sine of a sum and cosine of sum, uh, cosine of angle sum. Um, we know that sine is an odd function, cosine is an even function, sine of 0 is 0, and cosine of 0 is 1. Um, so everything else, if you are going to be using, you want to prove that. Of course, uh, I have skipped the proof of this theorem, and this requires quite a bit of work, which is why I'm skipping this. 
Okay, so that brings me to the end of this video. So next time we are going to discuss uh, integration and uh, then um, at some point when we when we are comfortable with integrations and we have built the theory of integrations, we can in fact talk about why the um, uh, natural log function in fact exists. Okay, so the theorem that we stated at the very beginning, we can prove that after we talk about integration and after we talk about um, fundamental theorems of calculus. Great, so I will see you in the next video.